this is the acorn electron. If you don't know what an electron is, I can sum it up in four words. Poor man's BBC Micro. There are a number of great videos that go into detail about the electron, so I won't go too deep into how it was briefly the biggest selling computer on the British market, nor how it almost ruined Acorn computers due to a combination of technical setbacks, various delays and high production costs. While somewhat compromised in many ways, the Electron had enough qualities to endear it to a loyal user base in the UK, many of whom affectionately referred to the Electron as the Elk. Despite going out of production in 1985, the Elk was well supported by software developers and magazine publishers until the early 90s. As of 2020, there is still a small but enthusiastic user base developing new software and hardware for fellow Elkaholics. The Elk was sold down under from early 1984 and was positioned as a cost-effective way to add terminals to a BBC micro network via Acorn's Econet local area networking environment. Acorn's Australian distributor, Barson Computers, went so far as to develop and release an Econet adapter to support this market position. Despite this, I have never seen an Electron for sale in Australia. I bought mine from New Zealand, where the Elk did relatively well, perhaps as a result of the success of the BBC Micro on the other side of a ditch in the home computer market, as well as its positioning as the Baby Beep. My first impressions are extremely positive. For a relatively diminutive machine, the Elk feels substantial. To be honest, I can't even tell if this case is yellowed. Whether or not any yellowing has occurred will become obvious once I crack this machine open. Much of the cost reduction is under the skin, including a ULA with many of the Beeb's custom chips incorporated into the design. Unfortunately, the Beeb's legendary Mode 7 Teletext style graphics proved a bridge too far, although Mode 036 are offered. Naturally, BBC Basic is the lingua franca that binds the Beeb and the Elk. If you avoid using Mode 7 and or any Beeb specific machine level commands, there's a very good chance that your code will run on both machines without any issues. Definitely a huge selling point for anyone who wanted to actively participate in the BBC's computer literacy project but couldn't afford a full fat beep. Some cost reduction is obvious on the outside, including a relative paucity of ports. That said, Acorn put a lot of thought into which ports they included. Offering three types of video output, Color RGB, Monochrome Composite and RF, the Elk was an attractive option across a wide range of potential users, and the cassette port includes motor control. As a standard 7-pin DIN connector, rolling your own cassette cable is dead easy. I managed to MacGyver a rudimentary cassette cable with an old 3.5mm aux lead and a paperclip, and I made this slightly neater looking example with a real 7-pin DIN connector and some store-bought leads in under an hour. If you need more ports, there's an edge connector on the back. This is most commonly associated with the Plus One, an expansion unit that was basically a joystick interface on steroids. Acorn's other official expansion unit was the Plus Three which featured a floppy disk controller and a 3.5 inch floppy disk drive. This Elk needs a little bit of tinkering to bring out its best. For starters, I'll be modding the composite video to output in colour, as well as trying to figure out what happened to the colour that the RF modulator is supposed to supply. The keyboard is also a bit stiff and crusty, which is as good a place as any to begin. I guess probably a good time for me just to work out exactly how stiff this keyboard is, so what I'll do is I'll actually see what colour I can make, it's usually a good sign. Hang on. Oh. Okay, try that again. Color. Cur. Okay, so I don't have an O or an L. I'm going to try pushing these keys one by one and see what I get. This is a new fault because this wasn't doing it last time I got this elk out, as you may remember. That's how I was able to get Chucky Egg loaded in the first place. I mean, try loading something now. Yep. Add. Hmm. Whether or not it's just a dirty keyboard, because you can even hear that even the buttons that are working, even the keys that are working rather, like that, that caps lock. I don't know why I'm pressing that, but they're all feeling a bit crunchy, so... Got to crack it open and clean out the keyboard anyway. The 9, the O, the L, and the full stop. Yeah, that's very similar to an issue that the Retro channel had. Am I going to have the same sort of issue that he had with his Commodore 64? I guess we'll find out once I crack this open. 
So let's just open this very carefully. That's... What the... Looks like something may have been spilled on this at some point. But it would explain why the keys are a bit crunchy. Yeah, you can definitely see there's a film of who knows what. That looks like it's been reworked at some point there. Um, you can tell that that solder masking is not great. Um, or maybe these things just gradually just start sweating when they get to this sort of age. It looks... Yeah, either way, that's going to need to clean. That might be enough to actually make this work properly again. But while I've got it here and all under... Well, sort of, you know, in pieces, I might as well dig a bit deeper and give it a really thorough clean, clean all the contacts and so on and so forth. And also just have a look at some of this solder because, whoa, Nelly, ooh, that meant to be like that. Check that one out, holy. So that would explain why the keyboard's looking a bit interesting. Now, while we're here, let's look at the main board. Now we can see this is an issue four. And we can, it will see it a bit better when I turn it around the right way. So this is an issue four board. Now, the great thing with the electrons is that the capacitors themselves are actually pretty good. Acorn didn't skimp out on these. I don't believe I'll need to recap this at this stage, so I'll probably just let that go for now. Okay, looks like 22nd of May. Is that 22nd of May 1984? I think this was made. You can see there, May 22nd is the date. And you can see most of the date codes on the chips here. Uh, the main CPU, 6502, uh, second week of 84. As for the color, composite mod. LK4 needs to be shorted. Mark Fix's stuff made a great video about this. He fitted a jumper. And the way he did it is, obviously, you pop a jumper on there. If the jumper's in there, you get in color. You pull the jumper out it's mono, and that's a really elegant solution. I don't have any spare headers, unfortunately, for jumpers, so I'm probably just gonna put a tiny bodge wire there to go between those bits of LK4. You know, it'll work, and it's reversible, so it's not like it's a permanent change to this, so it'll keep nice, well, it might be absolutely original, but getting it back to originality is as simple as unsoldering a tiny wire, so I'm not overly concerned about that. Now I'm thinking of the old urban legend about the toothbrush and the camera and the people that went on holidays. You can join the dots. Now I've taken it out of the uh, computer. Yeah, keys still feel a bit, a bit marginal, so it's a matter of pulling off the keycaps and seeing what happens. So that's the keyboard almost completely denuded. The top two rows were a real challenge. I found that the keys were trying to fight their way against me. They did not want to come off and I suspect again it may have had to do with whatever was spilt on here or, or something along those lines. The bottom two rows were simple. So I've taken out a fair bit of the solder using the solder sucker and I'm going to use a bit of wick just to mop up the remains of these two here. Not that there's much to mop up but we can see here but that's... Yep. I'm going to 
refire these two here. Now bear in mind I'm not going to put the keycaps straight back on just yet. Yeah, that looks like it should be all right. Yeah, the rest of them, not fantastic, but meh, it'll do. I won't be reassembling anything tonight. Um, what I will be doing though, is I'll be putting a bit of contact cleaner into each of these switches, give it overnight to soak in, and uh, then I'll get cracking on washing these delightful keycaps. These ones here, testing it all out, making sure that the keyboard works all tickety-boo. Once I know the keyboard's all apples, then it'll be a case of doing the composite mod. Ooh, okay, that one's still a bit sticky. Bear in mind it was around here. Of course, when we turn the board around the other way, you can see it was about here. That was the issue. So that could probably do with a bit more. I reckon this is where I started sort of easing up a bit. Well, Q feels better than it did, I can tell you that much. Well, by this time it was getting kind of late, so I figured that was enough for one night. And I think that's enough for one video. Until next time, See you later.